We have two speakers this afternoon. Uh, our fir first speaker is someone I'm sure you know well, Professor Luke Clements, who is the Cerebra Professor of Law and Social Justice at the School of Law, Leeds University. Uh, he's told me not to read his bio, uh, it's in the booklet, um, but just to say he's published widely in the fields of public law and human rights, he's been engaged in several law and public policy reform initiatives, uh, and also has been active in proceedings before the Commission and the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so I'm going to hand you over now to Luke. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much um, for inviting me, not that most of you here invited me, but thank you very much for those that did invite me. Can I say a special thanks for all the support staff uh, who've doing all the running around and making my life and I'm sure all of our other lives really, um, really easy. It's a great pleasure to be here, sort of foremost summer school in the world, I should think, on disability. Um, and I, I saw two of the wonderful pr presentations this morning, Mary um, Romero and Eleanor Lisney's. I missed uh, Professor Danders, unfortunately, so if there's some repetition, I apologize for that, but I was otherwise occupied in um, the uh, center's work. Um, I'm gonna speak for about 40 minutes. I'm basically a warm-up act for Phil Kennedy Bruin, who will then speak after me, um, and then hopefully there will be time for, for some good discussion. I, I've been asked to speak about intersectionality and community living, and um, I'll do this from a very practical level. Um, I'm a, I am an academic, but i am much longer been a practicing lawyer, so I'm less theoretical, I'm less clever, um, and I'm interested in how you can operationalize this stuff. Um, and as I say, I'll try not to cover what's been covered. Some of what I'm doing is to use some images, uh, and I'll explain what those images are, but they're basically um, from art. I'll try and explain that um, you can look at intersectionality a bit like the way we've moved from formal depiction in classical painting to the more um, abstract cubism and pointillism and impressionism and uh, downright abstractionism um, and that may not work at all because I've never done this talk before but uh, th that's ex effectively what I'm going to try and do you might think when you write your notes it would have been better without the images um, I should say I don't like the word intersectionality uh, because um, in my real life uh, uh, as a lawyer dealing with um, my, my research center is funded by a disabled children's charity, and we try to find practical ways of using the law to solve practical problems uh, that families with disabled children experience. Um, and what we try and do is to say, how can you solve this problem if you don't have a sister who's a barrister? Um, how, how, how can you actually get what you want? And I'm sure that if I spoke to 99% of my uh, families that we work with, none of them would understand the word intersectionality. Um, so that's the reason I, I, I think it's a fascinating idea um, and uh, a very positive uh, contribution, but I, I, I have reservations. I was talking to a colleague um, uh, who agreed, but we're not quite sure on what we, word we'd use to substitute, so I'll use the word intersectionality. <coughs> I've got um, four bits to my talk. Hopefully, I'll get through them. Uh, the first bit is um, the value of intersectionality for community living. Um, and, and I'm going to be saying that there are sort of many dimensions of intersectionality, I think. Um, and interconnection is one. It's not just about, about the individual and with their multiple personalities and identities. Um, but also, they have multiple interconnections with um, other people, communities. Um, I'm going to then get on difficult ground because I think there are quite severe limitations to inter, 
sectionality if you want to operationalize it, if you want to make a real difference to people's lives. Um, and um, I'm going to finally conclude with other theories that I, that I think are complementary. They're not contradictory, I think they're complementary. But I think as a theory of analyzing the, word in, the world, intersectionality is fascinating and it's correct as a, a tool to increase community living I think it's got very severe limitations. So I'm probably treading on thin ice then, but um, that won't matter because uh, Phil will follow me and uh, you'll forget what I've said. Um, so we, we, we see that intersectionality is about awareness, it's about seeing things for what they are, um, and about power relationships, effectively. And... Uh, it coming out of the sort of the great General Motors case where the applicants couldn't win because they weren't discriminated because they were black and they weren't discriminated against because they were white. Um, they were discriminated because I mean, they were discriminated because they were black women. Um, and of course, we've heard for, I heard one of the earlier questions saying that in Canada that's still a problem. You've got to pick one um, protected characteristic. In the UK, that's not an issue anymore. We 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 we've widened it, but you've still got to pick two. Um, no more than two. Uh, um, so where do we start? Well, I'll start with what Eleanor said yesterday, uh, this morning. Um, uh, start where you are. Do you recognize your own privilege? Do you think beyond your own rights? Think about yourself. Well, I'm pretty well as privileged as you can possibly imagine, uh, I think. So I'm probably here as a good example of the enemy, uh, 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 which is... Which is what my role is, I suppose. I was talking to one of my colleagues at Leeds um, who's far cleverer than me, just writes beautifully. She articulates beautifully. And I was saying, I've got to do this awful, this wonderful talk in, in Galway on intersectionality. Um, you know, what am I going to say? And she's, you know, because it seems to me it's very theoretical. And she said, well, you know, she, she talked me through it and held my hand. And she said, of course, you know, I may appear incredibly clever, I may have all these attributes, but, you know, I was brought up on a council estate and I've got the wrong accent, and that's a big problem, and it's a big problem in England, um, having the wrong accent. So you, you, you shouldn't necessarily assume that sort of white, privileged people feel themselves to be all that privileged. Um, and uh, she certainly has never, ever got over that and she could she could explain it in great detail so start where you are well i know i'm privileged and i'm very very lucky uh, the analysis i say has done a great deal to to um analyze the multiple layers of disadvantage that exp disabled people experience and what we would say in the uk i think is that that's at the heart of what we would say the person-centered approach um, personalization. Personalization is big in the UK. It's a bit of a um, smokescreen, but at the heart of it, the government has effectively got this idea of person centered planning. It's not about you're a cripple, you're a lunatic, you're an idiot, which the legislation was framed in those terms in 1948. It's about you with all your specific. Um, identities. And so the CARE Act was an act I was very involved in um, sort of pushing through. Um, it has principles, a lot of principles, but it starts from the assumption that the person with disabilities is best placed to judge their well-being. That, that they can articulate and define what their needs are and what they um, want in order to address those needs. And that whoever is involved in that process must ensure that it's based on the, it's not based solely on the individual's age or appearance or any condition of the individual or aspect of the individual's behaviour, which might lead others to make unjustified assumptions about the individual's well-being. That's really positive. That's about putting the decision maker as the person with disabilities um, rather than the professional and about the avoidance of stereotypes. So this is creeping into living 
um, community living. The Act itself has got a fundamental principle in favour of independent living, and the guidance says that at the heart of it is Article 19 of the CRPD. So as legislation goes, it, it looks, it rocks. Um, so what I say here, we've covered really every person with disability is unique, experience multiple forms of oppression, abuse of privilege. It, privilege is a word I'm going to keep coming back to. It's a word I think, that's, it's been used a lot this morning, but it's a word that I think is in a way the key to operationalizing. Um, it's not about looking so much at disadvantage, but inappropriate privilege that we've got to be concerned about. Um, so you may be treated differently because of a protected characteristic, the classic sex, race, disability, religion. Or intersections between these, as we've seen, um, that's really what intersectionality is about, being a black woman or, or, or all of those multiple permutations. But it could be unprotected dimensions, unprotected by law, um, and of course class and socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, and I'm going to look at some unprotected relationships. Much of my work, much of my writing is about carers. They're a group I find fascinating, really fascinating. Um, I think... Um, Anyway, that's what I do. Um, they're an unprotected group. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that group. Uh, so intersectionality challenges privilege power relations. Crenshaw uh, talked about that. Uh, Anti-discrimination law, how black women are theoretically erased by a focus on privileged group members. She's written recently some really interesting stuff about police violence against black men. Uh, it's always a black man. But in fact, she's saying, you know, there's just as much police violence against black women. But of course, they're not the privileged group. So the focus has always, um, uh, as ever, been on black men. And, and it calls to mind um, <clears throat> use my finger now. Down there. No, there's too many images on this one. Shall I start again? It's frozen. Down, down. Oh, it is frozen. Escape. We all have to go home now. It's all right. <laughs> and it was good. It was, it was, I hope that's cleared it up. Yeah. Um, Sorry, maybe. Yeah. We'll have to reboot it. Yeah, it looks like um, that. What, what, what you'd see next, and I'll sort of go on from memory, is. Um, no, well. <laughs> it is this privileging of, uh, of groups. Uh, I don't know how many of you have um, read Michael Oliver's uh, classic uh, book on um, the social model. Uh, I don't know how many of you can recall the, the image that appears on the front of that. Uh, has anybody read it? What's the image on the front? I can't remember. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, is it still there? No. Oh, no, that's another one. That's, that's my click of king. Oh, okay. um, on the front of Michael Oliver's book, uh, which is an image I show over and over again to, to students when I'm trying to explain what the social model is, is the classic image of the individual in a wheelchair at the bottom of a flight of stairs. And at the top is the polling station. Yeah? You must have seen that thousand times. You're not going to see it now because I just crashed the system. Um, but uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's a cheap thing. It's a fantastic image. It's a fantastic way of expressing the social model of disability. But it is a bloke in a wheelchair. And most disabled people are not blokes, actually. Most disabled people are women. Um, and uh, they're not in wheelchairs. Um, it's a good image, but it, you, you, you think, well, why couldn't that have been a woman? And why couldn't it be to do something that wasn't a slightly cerebral activity, like voting? I know there's a lot of 
case law on what you need to understand to vote. But it's an interesting image that we, we immediately could question if we were intersexually minded. Um, it's booting up. You're now seeing a series of um, uh, cubist pictures, um, people with fragmented faces. Um, this one is Picasso. This one is Francis Bacon, a really unpleasant sort of Francis Bacon image of somebody with this sort of weird ah, face. And this one is a lovely one. I think it's somebody else. Um, uh, and, and so what we're starting off with this idea of um, uh, the fractured personality with these multiple dimensions to their image. They are but from a working class background, they're from a poor background, they're, from, uh, they're white, they're disabled people. Um, and of course, persons with disability are, prominent, uh, are predominantly older. And that's something we tend to forget in the literature because much of the um, early movement came from young activist American um, college graduates. But then the vast majority of disabled people are older, they're women. Um, they're economically disadvantaged, they're predominantly other, um, and they're a mixture of all of these things. And what I say then is, that's fine. That much we've already covered today, um, and I'm 15 minutes into my talk. Um, the next image is, a, is a, an image by uh, Pierre Mondrin, which is a... Um, which is an abstractionist picture where instead of him fragmenting a face's image, he just drew a series of lines. It's called um, a pier on the water. He's the lines of the waves and the lives of the pier. It's a brilliant image. You're going to miss it because I'll have moved on by the time this loads. But it's, it's, it's about lines joining. What I'm using that is, is intersections. It's lines between people and the world. You're not just an image, you're not just a person, you know, relational autonomy will tell us. We have um, these complex interrelationships with everybody else, which I would say is an intersection between two people. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in is family, because much of my research is done with um, family carers. It should be on... Yeah, or five. Five, yeah. I was it? Was it my fault? It's always your fault. <laughs> no, oh, always blame the Englishman. Yes, this is right. right. Yeah. I've had on? this explained to me. What number you on there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here to take that. I'm here to take the flat. Um, is that it? Is this where we are? Yeah, I think that's where we are. Brilliant, okay. Um, we'll have to go back to see this PM Mondrian uh, this picture, shot? this one here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a lovely image. So you missed, um, the, the, so I'm putting these images on the left hand side. That's the Mondrian image. Uh, there it goes. Um, uh, uh, so I'm really interested in family uh, because I'm interested in disabled young people. Uh, and of course, you have parent carers who are age and uh, relationships, grandparents, uh, carers, sibling carers, young carers, disabled people. Status. Um, and of course, caring is highly gendered as well as it, it paid work as I'm, I, I mean, I'm very interested in paid carers too. Uh, many are Women, older women, low-paid immigrants, often. Um, so if we take a young person with disability as an example, their greatest hope of avoiding institutionalization is a supportive family. It's simple. It's the true in, in, in Central Eastern Europe. It's true in the UK. I'm working with lots of young people with really uh, challenging autistic spectrum conditions. 
their chances of not going into an institution depend on their family coping. Um, and their family coping depends on the resources the state can give them if the family doesn't have those resources itself. Um, but families need support. And families have these interconnecting connections within themselves. Um, so you have this young person with these characteristics, but you have this complex with this family. Um, and, of course, the person with disability will be a son, so they will have an intergenerational relationship, a sister and a brother, a horizontal relationship, nephew, niece, and um, grandparent, stepchild, and so on. So if you have a, a person with disability as a son or a daughter, you're a parent of a disabled person, where does the power lie? Where does the legal duties rest? With whom do they collide? You might... I mean, legally, the power... The duties are to the child, not to the mother or the father. Um, the, the legal focus is the child. But the child's chances of enjoying community living will depend very much on the mother, normally, uh, being the person to whom some, um, some power rests. And, of course, there's the state as well. The mother may not be able to work, um, may have no right to work. In the UK, they do have a right to work now, a big change because of the Care Act. <laughs> they have their loss of choice and control. They, what I call, uh, many of the people I work with, I call them warrior mothers because they have become very combative to get their disabled child the rights that they are entitled to. And by that, they undergo sort of, sort of traumatic stress condition change of personality. They weren't born combative, but the system has made them combative. And that makes them almost disabled people. And then the child has that interesting experience of being brought up by somebody who's got post-traumatic stress syndrome caused by the state. So you get these intersections. And um, I don't know if you've read uh, Madalena um, Carmona's report on uh, extreme poverty and human rights, and she says it's hard to think of a human right that is not potentially affected in some way by the unequal distribution and difficulty of unpaid care. Um, she says it's the biggest single issue about the gendered nation of care. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through that, I'm going to sort of lengthen my stride. But I mean, I do, when I'm working a lot with families with disabilities, it's the siblings that suffer. The siblings have no rights. They are in the shadows. But if you have a child with extreme needs, they, the siblings lose out on a childhood. And many of them suffer um, consequent harms because the parent has to devote all their energy to the disabled child because that support that should be provided isn't available. And so you get that internet connection um, because brothers and sisters and family are the key thing to promoting the independent living now and in the future for disabled children. And in the UK, we have this thing called the whole family approach, where, again, that's a very positive image. We don't just say it's the disabled child and everybody's got to jump because of the disabled child. What we're saying is the disabled child can't have an ordinary life if we don't actually meet the needs of all the people with whom they have interconnections, and, and they are equally in focus. And then you've got these, 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 these fascinating sort of issues about what duty does the state have to the mother? Uh, she's a carer. Um, and I don't know how many of you are aware of the Coleman and Attridge law case, but it's a, it's a fascinating um, dis decision of the European Court of Justice. Um, the, the facts are fairly straightforward. Forward. Sharon Coleman has a disabled son. He's got quite severe breathing difficulties. She's got a job working for a law firm, and she occasionally has to take time off work in an emergency because Oliver has to go to hospital. And sometimes she's got to take off time because um, he's got routine appointments. And she gets really serious harassment from her employer, taking time off work for that effing child again. Um, she feels that it's so difficult, she leaves. 
she then claims unfair dismissal. And of course, she can't win because she's been discriminated against because she's a carer, and carers are not a protected group. So she says, well, I've been discriminated against because of disability. Not my disability, but my son's disability. My interconnection with disability has had an adverse impact on me. But it then has to prove that that adverse impact has affected her son. The fact that she's had a nervous breakdown, she's lost her job, doesn't matter. She can claim that she's been treated adversely on disability, but she has to prove that the adversity rests with her son. Um, and the European Court of Justice Advocates General Opinion is brilliant. Uh, where he says the dignity of a person with disability is affected as much by being directly discriminated against as it is by seeing someone else suffer discrimination merely by virtue of being associated with him. In this way, the person who is the immediate victim of discrimination not only suffers a wrong himself, but also becomes the means through which the dignity of the person belonging to the classification is undermined. That her son suffered by seeing that his mother was being bullied because of his association with her. So, carers get some limited protection because being nasty to a carer upsets or potentially upsets or potentially alienates a disabled person. But the carer herself is not an object of any interest at all because she's not one of those protected categories. And there's been a recent, a very important case where the European... Court of Justice, effectively the UK, but it was um, said that there's no duty to make reasonable adjustments for a carer in associative discrimination. Her daughter had Down syndrome. She was working for the Ministry of Defence in Germany. The only way that the daughter could get adequate further education was for her to return to the UK. But there was no duty to help the mother return to the UK. So um, carers lose out. You've not only got multiple intersections between the person's own sense of identity and between themselves and their environment, their nearest and dearest, their friends, their family, but you also have huge intersections between these intersections. Um, and that creates a complexity the law just can't deal with. As we've seen, the law strains itself to find in favour of Sharon Coleman, who's being treated badly because of somebody else's impairment. But the law basically can only deal with black and white issues. And that's not the experience of disabled people. Um, they don't have black and white problems. They have a different experience. Now, one of the most fantastic articles you could ever read is by somebody called Stephen Wexler in the Yale Law Review about 40 years ago, <clears throat> when I was middle-aged. Um, and he said this about poor people, but this is so true about disabled people. So I, for poor people, I would just say disabled people. Disabled people do not leave settled lives into which the law seldom intrudes. They're constantly involved with the law in its most intrusive forms. Disabled people must go to government officials for many of the things which not disabled people get privately. Life would be very difficult for the not disabled person if he had to fill, in, fill out a tax return once a week or twice a week. Poverty creates an abrasive interface with society. Disabled people are always bumping into sharp legal things. The law school model of personal legal problems, of solving them and returning the client to the smooth and orderly world in television advertisements doesn't apply to disabled people. They don't have single issue problems. When we deal with them, they've got five problems. And when we solve a problem, they don't say thank you because a sixth problem has arisen to fill the space. They have multiple problems successionally. They've always got five problems. They don't have a broken leg and you get them compensation and they go happily back. There's always another problem. They have what we call clustered legal problems. Um, and that's, therefore, the other dimension of complexity. Um, 
Their, their problems come in clusters, not discrete black and white challenges. It marginalises those who are multiply burdened and obscures claims that cannot be understood as resulting from discrete sources of discrimination. That's not me, that's what Kimberly Crenshaw said um, in 1989. And Professor uh, Mary Romero this morning said, problems arise among certain groups more quickly and will affect them in ways that are much more visible. She's saying exactly the same thing, I'm repeating what she's saying. So I'm saying here, intersectionality is a tool for social change is a really powerful tool. It's a really powerful way of arguing it. It's a really good rhetorical way. It's a, it's a hugely useful tool for analytical purposes. But as a legal tool, I don't think it's very useful. It's talking about complexity. And the law can't really deal with complexity. It's multidimensional, it's identity-based. And, 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 and identity is incredibly important because um, but, but, but just, I, I did quote, I'm on time, thanks. Um, Samuel Baganestas talks about, he analyzes the disability discrimination law in the United States after um, almost 15 years, had really made no impact at all on the lives of disabled people. Um, bringing claims for unfair dismissal, bringing claims for accommodation, minute number of people had done that. It had made very little. If you had a sister who's a barrister, yeah, that's great. But if you don't have those things, you don't have those networks, you don't have those advocacy support, it doesn't work. It has really makes very little change. <clears throat> Uh, we have a proliferation of protected statuses. Um, we've got a whole list of things that are in line to be added to protective statuses. Obesity, albinism, poverty, genetic disorders, prisoners, carers. That proliferation will go on. We've got a fragmentation of identities. It used to be sex. Now it's gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, sexual orientation, LGBTIQIA, and so on. Um, we've now got carers. But when I we were doing, I, I was involved in. Sorry, um, when I was involved in work with carers. Um, 22 years ago, we passed the first Carers Act in the UK. We just talked about carers' rights. Now there's parent carers, adult carers, young carers, former carers, young adult carers, QGBTQIA carers. Um, we've got different excuses for different types of um, discrimination. So sex and race are privileged. Um, age and religion, there's many more grounds for permitting discrimination. Pregnancy doesn't always require a comparator. Normally, the others do require a comparator. Disability requires accommodation, but the others don't require accommodation, and carers don't get accommodation. And we've got different forms. We've got direct, indirect, associative, reverse, harassment, and victimization. And it calls to mind the Tower of Babel. I'm sure that, that, that languages are important, but this level of complexity is great in a university but it is completely ineffective if you're trying to draft a statute. And so we need to abandon identity in legislation, I think. I think this proliferation of protected statuses and different grounds has just gone too far. It's too complex. And identity doesn't work for carers, um, uh, curiously. Uh, they are a group that doesn't want to do it. Identity is very effective for some groups. Um, so it's been incredibly important for race. It's been incredibly important for the vote. You, you know, throwing yourself under the king's horse is in a very effective way of affecting change. Um, uh, and disabled people and gay people protesting has affected change. It has not affected change. Carers don't do that. Um, so that identity can work as a political force for change but it is becoming an ineffective tool when put within the law. So um, I look to other stuff on how you actually operationalize this. 
Um, and I look to um, somebody I'm staggeringly impressed by. Um, she's a colleague at Leeds, but she's an Emory in Emory in the States. I think she is writing some of the most extraordinary stuff. Um, and that's Martha Feynman. And so Martha says that intersectional approaches focus on multidimensionality on, to discrimination by individuals at best, it, individual institutions, and not the failure and distortions, the corruptions of society's structures. Formal equality, having built around formal identities, fails to sufficiently reflect the true human condition. Um, and she's interested in the unequal distribution of privilege, and that's what I think is the key in legislation. Very often when we're arguing a case in, in Strasbourg, we're not, set, we're not trying to define what dignity is. I think that's incredibly difficult, and there's been so many PhDs on that, and it's incredibly good academic. What we need to define is the opposite, indignity. Indignity is quite easy to say, that's indignity. That's indignity, that's indignity. Um, and so sometimes instead of looking at, uh, 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 at the, the, the complexity, you should look at the opposite. What's the problem with multidimensionality? Is the problem is privilege, the unequal distribution of privilege. And Martha's always saying that she's not concerned about low pay. She's concerned about high pay. Um, why aren't we having arguments about, you know, there should be limits to the extent of privilege that people have? Uh, she doesn't talk for a minimum wage. She's, she wants to have a maximum wage. So some way, the law is better at defining the limits of privilege, what we do, because the law privileges a huge number of people. And those people are people that historically have been involved in drafting laws. Uh, and Professor Romero this morning spoke on this. She said, privilege will not disappear by ignoring its existence. <laughs> Intersectionality is explicit in exposing unearned privilege and earned privilege that is not. And I mean, this is really John Rawls' subject about where would we allow inequality when it benefits the majority. Um, but we have a system which is um, privileging people to earn more money than half the world's population. Um, privileging people to um, have um, legal entitlements in employment and tax and education that um, are completely unearned. So it's a radical um, argument that she is doing, and she is using, I mean, I, I think it fits very well with a huge amount of the intersectional discourse, but I think that in legal terms we should be looking at questioning all the laws that provide privilege rather than trying to have this, this, this Tower of Babel complexity over what is discrimination and unequal treatment. So as Martha says, she says, just as we have created environments based on the needs of non-disabled people, so too have we created the environments based on the mythology of independent people political system that deifies independence, self-sufficiency, autonomy. But of all of us, we're dependent as children, and many of us will be dependent as we age and become ill or suffer disabilities. When dependency is uncompensated because it's gendered. And I think that um, Mira Romero ended on very much the same issue. And the issue, it seems to me, is privilege. So thanks very much. Um, thank you very much, Luke, and I think that really made a lot of connections with this morning's session as well. Um, thinking about the opposites, self and other, as Amita reminded us, and other is self. Um, but also we spoke this morning, um, although I don't know if we mentioned Martha Feynman's work, but about around the universality of vulnerability and the frailty of the human condition. Um, also, I just want to mention uh, the this whole significance of care work, and we're going to come on again to talk more about that. But as I'm sure many of you know, in Ireland, we will have a referendum, another referendum uh, in the autumn. Uh, this time it is essentially about care and care work and it's uh, but it's been presented at the moment as a, about repealing the provision on uh, women in the home which is in our constitution 
I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's uh, the provision that refers specifically to a woman's life within the home, uh, how through her life within the home she contributes to the common good, um, and follows on then to talk about women not being forced by economic necessity to neglect their duties within the home. And it has been rightly criticised, of course, as, as stereotyping women in a particular role. And unfortunately, it has never been used successfully uh, to ground rights for women who are working within the home uh, as carers or otherwise. Um, and it, there's a really landmark Supreme Court judgment, also the Senate case, where the majority of the court rejected the very arguments that Luke was talking about. Um, uh, Jamie Sinnott and her mother, Kathy Sinnott, trying to make use of that provision to actually vindicate uh, their rights and Kathy's rights as a, a parent of a child with a disability. Um, but that was rejected by the majority of the Supreme Court, but uh, our later Chief Justice, Susan Denham, gave quite a strong dissenting judgment to kind of think about how the, that provision of the Constitution could be turned around to be a positive recognition of care. And so some of the discussions now about the uh, women in the home provision in the Constitution is, are whether it should be simply repealed um, or whether it should be replaced, made gender neutral, uh, but also recognizing the positive contribution uh, of carers and the obligation on the state to support that role, um, to build resilience, as uh, Feynman talks about. Um, so it will be an interesting discussion. We had a constitutional convention talking about what should replace it, and there was very strong support for grounding uh, socioeconomic rights of carers and obligations on the state uh, in that provision. Um, I'm not sure that that's where we're going to get to, um, but it, it, it will again raise the question of uh, state support for the role of carers. Um, delighted now to introduce our next speaker, um, who uh, will be known to all of you, I'm sure. She is Galway based, uh, Phil Kennedy Bruin, who's a long time uh, disability rights campaigner and activist, parent of Grace, and has been campaigning. Uh, in particular for their rights uh, to independent living. So, I don't think my time starts until you finish, does it? Your yeah. time starts now. Now, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Phil Kennedy Bruin, sometimes Bruin, sometimes not. It depends on my situation. But for this, the purposes of this, it's Phil Kennedy Bruin. And what struck me, what uh, Professor Luke was saying, I, don't, I, I had no intention of mentioning this, was the word privilege. My husband comes from privilege, a wealthy background, and I come from dire poverty. But just because it was poverty didn't mean we were stupid, so I married somebody wealthy. <laughs> and for me, privilege meant, the difference between myself and Ken is, Ken could buy whatever he wanted, and I worked for whatever I needed. And that's the full thing about privilege for me. And anything I have to say here is... Um, much more painful and not as complex as what Luke had to say, but it, that's a whole different thing. Um, I, I understand and appreciate research and intersectionality and all of that, but it doesn't mean much in my life. But I do know this, that looking for any rights, I know why gay people are so successful, because gay people are fighting their own fight. But people with disability are depending on other people, like ye, for instance, but mainly me. This is my daughter, Grace. She's 25 and I'm 70. Don't forget this glamour and that I don't look it. Forget all of that. I am 70. <laughs> and when Grace was born, we were given um, a load of new words to use. Integration, early intervention, 
stimulation, mainstream school, swimming for some reason, why anybody thought I'd go, be going swimming, I don't know. But then they told me the swimming was for grace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, swimming. Um, I live in Bohemore in Galway, which is the first council estate in Galway, and we're used to differences. So Grace wouldn't have been seen as different. When I said to my neighbour, you know Grace has a problem, she said, she'll never have the problems that mine have. Yeah. And they might say, God help us, if it's still okay to say God without getting jailed. Um, so we did all of that. She, she wasn't born with an instruction book. So she went down to the Common to Mercy School with all of the other girls in the neighborhood. And up there, there's a lad in a wheelchair, and there's a lad who is deaf, and there's travelers. They weren't called travelers then. They changed their name. They also changed my name. They called me the Settled Community. I cannot tell you how unsettled I am. And she did all of that. And then she was a person. She was just Grace. I saw there in the things that I read the word personhood. So she wasn't a Downs named Grace. I don't see anybody here who has Down syndrome. Maybe there is. Um, she was just Grace. So in school she had an SNA and I knew the SNA's mother. So it'd be all that kind of thing. And she did great. And uh, we did the um, speech therapist come into the house. The house was sometimes a hospital, another time it was a classroom. It was rarely home. And mostly when these therapists came to the house, you couldn't get rid of them. For people that were so busy, you could not get them out of the house. So um, we did all that anyway for Grace. And she was in school and she was doing everything and all of that. Then she, uh, meanwhile, the thing about research, and I was saying to Luke, when Grace was three, I was misdiagnosed with breast cancer, and this is important. And I was gone up there and I was very tired, and they said, you're tired because you have a child with Down syndrome. I don't know now if that has to do with privilege or intersectionality, but that's what they said to me anyway. And by the force of my own personality, which you've grasped by now, um, some people call it being common, um, kind of educating Rita. Um, then they said to me, yes, you do have a very rare form of carcinoma, because they won't call it cancer. I said, well, am I supposed to feel chosen because <laughs> it's rare? Yeah. And the professor said to me, he wasn't a professor now like Luke, he was another kind. Um, he said to me, well, out of 15,000 women in, swim, in Sweden who were tested, none of them had the carcinoma you have. I said, well, I don't care, <laughs> because I was having a radical mastectomy the next day. And I had a three-year-old child with Down syndrome. And I had sisters then, and I had brothers then. I don't have them now. And they mind her. So on we went anyway. Just, um, and this is where privilege. When, when, when you come from my background, you have the mastectomy. I come out of hospital on Christmas Eve and bought a turkey. <laughs> Ken's crowd probably sit in a pink bathrobe for like three years. But I don't come from that. I come from functionality. I come from the place of no choice. And there's a lot to be said for no choice. Now, I know that Luke is over there thinking she's everything I, I feared she'd be. <laughs> so um, Grace then went to secondary school. And it was just terrific. And the SNA, whose mother I also knew. And I had done her favorite one time, which I cast up to her immediately. So she, um, the school was great. They arranged for Grace to sit her junior cert. And there was a lot of work put into all of this. Uh, what I'll tell you about Grace is she's like me. I can see by your faces, you're worried. 
you worry that she has another condition. <laughs> so at that time, she was then 17, and the house next door came up for sale. And it's a terraced house, and we couldn't believe our look. And so I phoned the solicitor, and um, I said, Frank, can a 17-year-old buy a house? He said, yes. I said, is she a first-time buyer, which is kind of a tax question? She said, yes, he said. I said, therefore, she's exempt from stamp duty, which is a tax, and was very high at the time. He said, yes. I said, that person is Grace. He said, no, Grace can't buy a house. He said, now you're not to go mad. I said, well, both of us know I'm going to go mad. Not only that, I'm leaving the house now to go over to you, which I did. So I asked him why Grace couldn't buy a house, and he said the thing, the Lunacy Act of 1871 that says idiots and imbeciles and all of that. I said, but why can't Grace buy a house? He said, well, he said, just don't jump across the desk. This is the way it is. This, I'm here, this is law. Why can't she buy the house, I said. He said, because she wouldn't understand the consequences of signing a contract. I said, well, she would know the difference between buying an ice cream and buying a house. She only has Down syndrome, yeah? She's not mad. He said, anyway, she can't buy the house. Now, as it happened, um, starting with Bernie Madoff, every banker in the world, every developer in the world, and most um, investors, they didn't know the consequences of signing a contract either. But they looked normal. And Grace was judged by her appearance. Her appearance said that she's not right in her head. With Down syndrome, there is one size fits all. Other disabilities are not visual. Mine, for instance, a breast cancer and bowel cancer. And look at me. I look like a retired call girl. <laughs> so we, uh, we, uh, I contacted the uh, Minister for Finance at that time, was uh, Brian Lennon Jr., who has since died. And by contacted, I mean I phoned him four times a day and sent him five emails <laughs> every day. So one day the phone rang and he said, uh, this is Brian Lennon. He said, will you, will you please stop phoning me? I said, well, I will. But we had, Ken had paid 7,800 in stamp duty for the discrimination against Grace based on her appearance. If the, the, if the solicitor hadn't seen her, would she be let buy the house? Some people buy houses over the phone. And the next time she buys one, she will be buying it over the phone. And um, Brian Lanahan, he said to me that he understood, and he did understand, and that he, um, he'd love to give back the money, but he didn't have the legislation. I said, well, you probably hadn't the legislation to take it either, but you, you got over that anyway. <laughs> but Brian Lennon was a very nice man, and he was in Galway at that time with the government having a think tank. That isn't what it turned out to be. But for those of you who are not from this country, I won't tell you about that. And Grace saw him on the news, and she said, we'll get in the car and we'll go up. We'll go up to the hotel to him. So she said to him, and he said he was very sorry, and he was very sorry. And he said, I will give the money back to you, and Grace said, when? People with Down syndrome kind of like that. They don't get into any intersectionality. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll give it back to you in December, and she said, what date? And he gave back every penny. And it was a revenue issue, and it was very difficult for him to do, but he did do it. And he also changed the law in relation to stamp duty, but not in relation to Grace's features. Grace was still in school. I did not know, and I'm very bright, I did not know that all the talk about Grace 
from the day of her birth and all the work she put in and all the work I put in and the family, I didn't know that we were on the road to nowhere. Grace did her uh, leaving cert and she wanted to, she was interested in working. She kind of has that Bruin thing, I want to, therefore it will happen. Where I'd be kind of, wouldn't it be great if, yeah. So she wanted to work in the city library and she's very bookish. And um, so at that time, the Irish government had a scheme called Jobbridge. It was not open to people with disability. At this stage, I realized that the charities had turned disability into an industry, of which I was only part, and that my child and other children were feeding. I didn't know that then. And so, Grace was interviewed for the job. Um, two years before she left school, we got in touch, the school got in touch with Employability West, and it was like an EU convention in the school for Grace to do this. She had the interview, she got the job, she was in the library. The library is in the city centre, so I drove her part of the way. She was there about two weeks, and I didn't hear anything from her. She didn't have anything to say about it. So I, um, I, I called the um, job coach, or whatever she, or she was, from Employability West, and she uh, said, I said, when are you going back to your job and let, you know, Grace do her job? She, so she hemmed and hawed. She said, uh, well, um, you see, the thing is, Phil, that um, I said, listen, darling, I have cancer in two places. I may not live long enough for you to get to the point. What is the point? <laughs> she said, the, the, the library, they're not comfortable health and safety reasons, they're not comfortable with her working on her own. I said, why? Who's the risk? So she said, I will have to stay with her. I said, so it's a job for you, really. It's not really a job for Grace. And she has no independence. I did not know from her birth that we were on the road to nowhere. And the moment she left school, personhood stopped, and she became a Downs because of her features. And then we got the Brothers of Charity and Ability West and Disability. They think if they change Disability West to Ability West, it'll sound better. And there was no place for Grace to go because of her features, nothing to do with her intellect. And I cried a lot. And I was seriously distressed. So I said to Ken, maybe we'll have to, you know, it's sitting at home with Jeremy Kyle, which compared to where she went was very much better. Or I just send her to a training center. I see these young adults being marched around the town, You're sitting in restaurants, eating buns, and I nearly lost my mind. But I tried to get past my own prejudice, and so did Ken. We sent her to a training center that didn't have any training. It didn't have any plan. It didn't have any outcome. And she was supposed to spend three years there Regressing. She hardly knew her name by the time, yeah. And then after three years there, she would graduate to another training center. And by then she'd be maybe 26, and then she'd come home to Mammy. Except it was looking like Mammy was going to be dead from cancer. But the best weapon in Grace's life and in my life is anger is anger. Anger gets very bad press. I'm going to start an anger support group. <laughs> There's a lot to be said for anger and denial. 
And my mother used to, she'd be sitting down and then she'd say, well, by Jesus, I'll do something about this. And the day Grace came home and told me that somebody took off her shoes and socks, cut her toenails, and called it uh, personal care, and VTAC 2 was the day that I didn't know what she was going to do, but I knew she wouldn't be doing that. She was very distressed every day that she came home. If it was called daycare, it would have been fine. But then they wouldn't get the grants if it was called daycare, so it had to be called training center. I'm very against it. And I fought with most of the charities. They all love me when I ring. They're always in a meeting about me, usually. <laughs> and so I knew what I wasn't going to do and what Grace wasn't going to do. But I didn't know what we were going to do. So I looked within my neighborhood. And there's a community hall there. And I asked the girl, what, what do you do? What, you know, what, what's going on there? She said, well, there's a seniors club and there's a preschool and there's um, an after school study group with 40 children um, doing their homework. It might be difficult for them to do it at work, at home for a variety of reasons, mainly because they wouldn't. And I said, could Grace work there? She said, well, I don't know. Send her up and we'll interview her. And then we got into personhood again. If she's fit for the job, we'll hire her. And if she's not fit, we won't. Only for my own community, Grace would have no life. Grace's guardian, mentor, and friend is sitting there, Mary plays a huge part in Grace's life. Because we live in a community, she has a life. So the, the talk about her living independently in the community, whose community? Is she going to live in a house belong to a charity? And their property portfolio? Yeah. They talk about direct funding. I can't tell you about the direct funding. <laughs> yeah. The begging and pleading for direct funding and the form filling and the receipts. Yeah. Grace, because of Ken's privilege, will live in her own house. Helen Keller was born in 1890, I think. And as a result of meningitis, she was blind, she was deaf, and she was mute. And her family, because of their privilege, hired a teacher, not a teacher with any qualification, a teacher with experience. And Helen Keller, went to Radcliffe, and she was an author. And she went around the America lecturing, she would now be called a motivational speaker. If Helen Keller was born now, she would be in a training center. Because, wouldn't you think it would be the reverse? So there's a lot here in front of me putting up a, 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 a a thing, a bit of paper with zero on it. I think that was meant for Luke. It certainly, I, I certainly don't think it was meant for me. Well, it was. So as I speak and finish here today, Grace is on holidays because she gets teacher's holidays. Yes. She gets teacher's holidays. She can walk to work herself. She can walk home. She could always do that, but it's a dangerous world. Yeah. She is like me, which is what will bring her through. 
when she's at home reading books and watching television and doesn't want anybody to talk to her, she's like Ken. Ken is a writer. Ken Brune is a writer, and this is the way it is with us. I'm the only reality in his life, and he's the only fiction of mine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm not sure if there's anything to follow that, but I'm going to open it up for any questions. <laughs>